Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridget. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today we're going to be talking to an author that I want you all to know about, because uh, my wife found her book about two weeks ago. It's a book on the abolitionist uh, female activist and noted literary figure of the 1700s, Hannah Moore. Now, I, I'd heard of Hannah Moore before, simply because Eric Metaxas uh, mentioned her quite a few times in his book on William Wilberforce, Amazing Grace, which is, is a phenomenal book, and you could tell he was obviously quite taken with her because he managed to slip in stories about her almost wherever he could. And uh, he said in the foreword to the book that I'm about to, to tell you about that he, he'd been encouraging somebody uh, to take on the story of Hannah Moore for quite some time. And the person who eventually took that on was Karen Swallow Pryor. She is a professor of English at Liberty University. She's a research fellow at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. And she's a member of the Faith Advisory Council of the Humane Society of the United States. And her book is called Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore, Poet, Reformer, and abolitionist. So after I read this book, I I found her contact information right away, and I messaged her and asked her for an interview, and she kindly agreed. And this is that conversation. Uh, when did you first hear about Hannah Moore? I was doing doctoral research for my PhD dissertation in the area of the 18th century English novel. I had never heard of Hannah Moore, not, neither had any of the professors on my committee, but literally after a day of prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord about my, my topic, I stumbled across her name in, a, in an obscure passage in an obscure book, and it talks about her literary contribution to the novel, and as soon as I read that, I knew I wanted to write my dissertation on her, and that was some years ago. I did do that. But I always had in mind when I wrote it that I wanted to write a popular biography of her someday. What was it about her that attracted you to her in the first place? Because Hannah Moore, there are very few people I say that name to and get any sort of glimmer of recognition. Well, I have the same lack of response <laughs> when I mention her name. Uh, so she's still relatively unknown, although I, I'm hoping that my book uh, has and will continue to change that. Uh, Again, because I was researching in the area of literature, what at first attracted me was the fact that here is this person that no one has heard of anymore who was so famous in her, her day. She was one of the first uh, English best-selling authors, and not only that, but she was an evangelical Christian, and she did not only uh, works in the area of literature, but in reform, abolitionism, and and. Uh, many other things, and she just made a mark in her day um, that was significant and lasting and was worth rediscovering. Yeah, that's one of the things that I, I wanted to ask, because I've always been very, very interested in poetry. I love reading it, and I, I'd never heard of her in that context, but just a lot of the snippets you provided in your book about her different poetry, uh, some of her stuff, even on the slave trade, is, is downright chilling and very, very well written. Uh, why is it the that is, is sort of excluded from the, the canon of English literature and, and, and is, is so rarely mentioned. I think of William Cowper's poem on Thomas Clarkson as well. It seems like these movements spawned an enormous outpouring of artistic expression that nobody thinks about anymore. That's an excellent question, and I'll try not to get too uh, geeky on you in my <laughs> literary answer. Um, her earlier works her, of poetry are, are very obscure. They're neoclassical. Um, they don't certainly fit into the tastes of today, and they're not great poetry. But as you've already mentioned, her slavery poem is remarkable and is important. It actually has been rediscovered and included in newer anthologies of either women's literature or romantic literature. So I've actually had the opportunity to teach it uh, in my undergraduate classes uh, a few times. So because, actually, ironically, of feminist literary criticism, which has rediscovered some of these minor women writers, Hannah Moore has been included in that rediscovery, even though most feminists um, resist her because of her conservatism, her devout faith, and so forth. But no one can deny the importance of uh, that poem in particular, which was su such a powerful expression of um, 
human liberty and and the creation of all people in God's image, and mm-hmm. it captures so well not only the uh, the problem of slavery at the time, but even many of the literary movements um, that converge in in that poem. Is it because of a feminist distaste towards her that she is classified? As a minor poet, because I, f- I first read about her in Eric Metaxas' book on, on William Wilberforce, so I was aware mm-hmm. of her as a figure, and then uh, when my wife actually discovered your book and we read it, then we started realizing just how much she'd done and, and, and the sort of the literary posse that she'd run with back in the day, including <laughs> Samuel Johnson and others. How is she still qualified as, as minor? Is it just in terms of the fact that a lot of her writing hasn't passed the test of time, or that because she was an evangelical Christian, uh, the outreach that she did isn't really noticed anymore? Uh, I'm just I'm very interested in in the disparity between the uh, the size of the figure in your book and the, the presence of of her in in history and literature. I took a history degree and I never heard of her. Right. Again, an excellent question that has uh, many layers of answers that I'll try to distill here. Uh, Of course, most women poets are considered minor because we can't go back and rewrite history and make their influence during their day bigger than it was. Um, So one one of the standards of being a minor or major figure is the influence that you have on on later writers. Um, so Moore was significant in her time, and she was revered and respected by important figures like Samuel Johnson, as you mentioned, and David Garrick, who ran the uh, theater in London and put on a couple of her plays. Um, but I would say, objectively speaking, that most of her literary works do not pass the test of time. They're very grounded in the age and in the aesthetics of the time, uh, even the 18th century that she was born into and that most influenced her style is not the most popular literary period today, even though it's my favorite. Uh, and then, of course, what happened in, in the late 19th century in terms of the modernist movement when a lot of these conservative and pious religious writers were relegated to the dustbin of history, mm-hmm. Hannah Moore came to represent sort of the the worst of conservative, moralistic, didactic Christian writers. Um, and she has that strain, but she's, there's still a lot left to, um, to appreciate and study and learn from today in her writings, I think. Right. So... That leaves a question as well. Why did Christians forget her writings? It makes a lot more sense uh, when you when you lay it out like that, that her writings were, mm-hmm. were left behind because she didn't have an influence on other movements and things like that. But uh, surely there's always a market niche, as it may be, for the kinds of pious, pious writing that she did. Well, I, that's, that's, again, a, an excellent question. And, and my short answer is simply that um, modern, contemporary... American, North American Christians don't read a lot of literature, um, <laughs> right. a lot of a lot of poetry and drama. Uh, so I think we've contributed to the neglect of not only Hannah Moore but many other figures who are uh, worthwhile to read. But we aren't we aren't literary enough in general to read poetry and drama. And her works of devotion are simply outstanding. Um, but the archaic nature of the language is probably an obstacle for many. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually have as a goal which uh, to have some of her uh, her devotional works republished at some point, because I think many Christians would would appreciate reading them and benefit from it. Right. And I, and I was thinking as you were talking here about how a lot of Hannah Moore's work, uh, you know, like the simplicity of it and, and the piousness of it and, and even the devotion of it, uh, doesn't resonate with a, a lot of people. The, the literature people do like tends to be more frantic. And and I look at the, the women writers who are most celebrated, the one the one that you know gets talked about all the time in left-wing universities, such as the one I attended, was Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. People seem <laughs> to be more attracted to this kind of trendy nihilism uh, and you know mm-hmm. an, an accurate depiction of of despair uh, than they are to something a lot more simple. Right. I mean, isn't the, it's one of the biggest trends on the internet now is is being messy and vulnerable and you know and um, and and I guess as you said, despairing. Um, and and it, you know we need to find that balance between being overly uh, overly 
Pollyanna-ish, for lack mm-hmm. of a better word, and being honest about about struggles. But uh, Hannah Moore really was honest about those things. Um, but she she has a seriously she has it, although she denied being a Calvinist, she and probably wasn't. She certainly emphasizes human depravity and sin and our need uh, for Christ and our need for the working of the Holy Spirit. I mean, these are things that are not popular with any anyone, including many Christian readers today. So let's, let's just tell the listeners a little bit more about Hannah Moore. So she she's best sure. known for for either being a literary figure or her relationship with William Wilberforce. So that just means she crops up in a lot of books that people might read, even though those books aren't specifically about her. So give us a little bit of an idea of who she was. Well, she was she's an interesting figure because she was born in the middle of the 18th century and lived almost to the middle of the 19th century in England, and those two periods are entirely different. Um, so she lived through a shift in the culture that I think is paralleled by the shift that we're experiencing in our culture, a shift from um, a, a very literary but yet uh, unbelieving age, just sort of a, a Christianity that was just on the surface and an age that, uh, that had... Had, was highly stratis- stratified between men and women and rich and poor. And then in the 19th century, which is where we the we see the Victorian age beginning and the age of social progress and improvement that was actually brought about by evangelicals like Hannah Moore. Um, so she she's a figure who reflects all of those changes that were taking place in the culture um, because because what happened in England really affected the rest of the Western world. She was born poor. She died wealthy. She was born a woman in a man's world and made her way there. She was born into a Christian family and into the Church of England, but had a personal sort of conversion experience that she expresses in in the language of the day and became an evangelical. And uh, so she, she reflects the worldliness of her early life um, and the transformation that Christ had on her and then the effects of that transformation on uh, on slavery, on issues of other other issues of social reform, such as animal welfare, um, teaching the poor to read. She opened Sunday schools across the countryside in uh, the west of England where she lived. Uh, she, historians basically credit her with having taught the nation to read, simply because she wanted to, the poor to be able to read the Bible, learn the catechism, and uh, be influenced for the better by the gospel. So she did so many different things and helped change her country, uh, and then uh, and then the world, really, because, because England was, at the time, the, the leading nation of the world. So what was her significance to, for example, the slave trade? Because there's been more attention paid to abolitionism as of late. And there's, you know, Mm -hmm. Eric Metaxas' great book, Amazing Grace, Adam Hodge's child book, Bury the Chains. And people are are starting to recognize that there's this this enormously interesting movement that they're ignoring. And, of course, there, there are political reasons that a human rights organization based on fundamentally Christian premises would be ignored. But, but... Now, this is where her name is kind of cropping up. What was her significance to that movement? Well, again, we can't go back and rewrite history, and I don't want to overplay the significance that she had. As a woman, she was actually not even allowed to be a member of any abolitionist societies officially, which were mm. all men. Even Wilberforce opposed the formation of women-only abolitionist societies. Um, she could not vote. She could not be a member of parliament. She could not do many of the things that the men who led the movement and that she worked with were doing. And those are the kinds of things that history tends to remember. So even within that limited role, I mean, she attended the meetings that the abolitionist group had um, at Wilberforce's home and at the um, home of the of the Middletons, who were some of the pioneers in the abolitionist movement. She wrote letters to her friends about all of the goings-on and the things that they were doing, the strategies they were using, the plans. She tried to convince her pro-slavery friends to oppose slavery. Uh, Her letters are filled with these kinds of appeals. Uh, She 
of course, we've already mentioned the very important poem that she wrote against slavery, which was, again, another strategy. It was timed to be released on the same day that Wilberforce was presenting anti-slavery um, legislation before Parliament. She wrote letters to the editor. She actually headed up one of the what's considered one of the most effective boycotts of sugar produced by the slave trade um, in England, which, as I say in the book, is no mean feat in a tea-drinking nation. So even in her limited role as a woman who whose public power was was so um, was so small, uh, she worked with the abolitionists. She worked with uh because the abolitionists had they they didn't just take one a one pronged approach to abolishing slavery. They knew the political part was important, but they also knew that appealing to people's hearts and minds and getting public opinion on their side was important. And that's where Hannah Moore really played the most important role. Um I just I basically say that, that she was the heart and hands of the abolitionist movement. Right. What was her, her relationship with people like William Wilberforce and John Newton? Uh, William Wilberforce and she were were instant friends from the moment they met. Of course, their relationship was not romantic. Moore never did marry, and uh, Wilberforce famously married the wonderful Barbara Spooner, and they had a uh, wonderful marriage. But they remained friends the entire life. Um, Newton uh, Newton was older by the time that uh, that uh, Moore met him, but it was actually Newton who was instrumental in Moore's expression of her personal relationship with the Lord um, and then becoming involved in the abolitionist movement. She was already had been opposed to slavery for a number of years, but she actually read one of Newton's um, important spiritual works, Cardiphonia, or Utterances of the Heart, and it was written anonymously. Moore didn't know who wrote it. Someone gave it to her, and she started trying to find out. We see, read this in her letter. She tried to find out who the author was, and when she realized it was John Newton, she went to visit him at his um, London church and to hear him preach. And in one of her letters, she writes that uh, after that first meeting, she came home. They, they spoke for a couple of hours after church, and she came home with her pockets full, stuffed full of sermons. Um, so I think that's a poignant expression of the kind of relationship that they had. He was right. a spiritual mentor to her. Now, one of the, the really interesting things that I've seen as well is that most people, when they look at England now, they think of the Victorian era, right? They think of the Bronte mm-hmm. sisters, and, and, and they think about Jane Austen, and they don't really have any idea uh, of the sheer extent to which England was a third world country in most areas prior to that. I was I was really taken aback by some of the descriptions uh, in your book about the, the little towns that Hannah Moore went traipsing about to trying to start up schools. <laughs> Uh, like, right. Tell us a little bit about, about the problem that she faced and, and, and the actions she did, in which I thought actually took tremendous physical courage to do some of the things that she was doing. Oh, absolutely. Um, again, this goes back to that transformation of the age that happened in the Victorian era, which was brought about by the evangelicals. We always think of, of that age when we think of England. But before this movement towards social reform and uh, helping, the idea of actually helping the poor, it's important to remember that up until that time, for most of human history, the belief was that whatever whatever class you were born into is the class that you would remain in. And so no one actually thought to help the poor or improve their lots in life. That's a very Christian and very evangelical idea. So uh, in the late uh, 18th century, while Hannah was working um, in the abolitionist movement, they, it wasn't the only thing she was working on. Wilberforce and Newton and the rest of their Clapham group were funding and helping her open these Sunday schools throughout the countryside of, of the west of England. Um, the Industrial Revolution was already taking place, and the people who were either um, wealthy landowners or wealthy uh, not factory owners, but pit owners um, or, uh, or, or, land, or farmers, were explo- it, was, it was just common to exploit the poor who had to work long hours, six hours a day. They had no economic power, no political power. They were oppressed mightily. And the idea of someone coming along and wanting to spend their one day off reading uh, on Sunday giving them school where they would learn to read and 
learn the catechism and learn better working skills, that was actually considered revolutionary. So Moore was opposed um, across the board by most of these wealthy men who the last thing that they wanted was for their cheap labor source to become educated and to for their lives to improve to such an extent that they could no longer be so easily oppressed. But, of course, Moore wanted to instill Christian doctrines and Christian values in them. That was her whole purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she had to really coddle and and politicize and strategize and, and convince these wealthy, powerful men to allow her to open these Sunday schools. So she couldn't just storm in and, and do it again against their will, she had to convince them, and, and her, she and her sister kept um, quite a uh, volume, volumes of, of uh, documentation of, of their efforts, um, and so it's all, it's all there in, in history to see and learn from. Yeah, Eric Metaxas makes the case that one of the reasons that uh, Wilberforce and Clarkson and Hannah Moore and all these other people have been forgotten is that because the things that they did changed the world so fundamentally, everyone forgot they changed it. Um, yes. That everybody forgot the world that was before and, 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 and were just took for granted so much the world that, that became uh, of their efforts and, and that, that that's one of the reasons that they're so forgotten. Would you concur with that thesis? Absolutely. As I said, the shift that occurred between the 18th century and the 19th century um, is so dramatic that, that as, as Eric says, we, we can't even recognize the world uh, for what it is today because we've, we so little understand the way it was before. The, the idea of social mobility, the idea of moving from one class to another was, I mean, I mean, no one could have imagined that before Hannah Moore's life. And she actually lived that. She's one of, I, I call her one of the first modern individuals because she was born to such a poor family and through her liter- first her literary success and then, um, well, really it was entirely through her literary success that she made her wealth, but she turned that wealth to the support of the Lord and the Church and um, the needs of her society at the time and ended up uh, dying a philanthropist whose money supported many missionary societies and schools and young ministers. Um, she became a, a great benefactor to many Christian efforts and people. So tell our listeners a little bit about the, the really wonderful biography that you've written on Hannah Moore so that people become more familiar with her. I was grateful to find out that it existed because I'd heard about her name. I heard her name, as I mentioned before, in abolitionist histories, but I had never seen anything uh, on her that was written in the last, you know, hundred years and was easily accessible. Right. Uh, so tell yes. us a bit about the book. Well, the, the book uh, is called Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore, Poet, Reformer, abolitionist, the long title that kind of encapsulates her, her very colorful and, uh, and significant life. Uh, it's published by Thomas Nelson Publishers here in, in the U.S., and it is available worldwide. Um, one of the delightful parts of, of writing that was not only going over to Bristol, England, where Hannah Moore lived and died and did all of this work, but um, that was a, a treat to, to go to the home where she was born and to go to her uh, the cemetery outside the church where she's and buried along with her sisters. Um, but we got to take some beautiful photographs of those sites, and so I really hope that I, I'm able in that book to bring this extraordinary person to life. Um, and I also provide a, a lot of historical context uh, to better understand the significance of what she did, because as you said, it, we often just don't, you know, we we take so many things for granted. Our, the the fact that slavery is 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 unthinkable today, uh, and the fact that women can get educations and and so forth. Um, and so I try to provide a historical context for better understanding the significance of of her life and the obstacles that she faced. Now, Eric Metaxas says this in the preface to your book. Uh, he talks about how we need more mores. Uh, and <laughs> we, in some ways, live in a society similar to that one in terms of uh, we were Christian, now we're post-Christian, and we must become Christian mm-hmm. again. What do you think mm-hmm. Hannah Moore teaches us for our time? Because well, as I read that book, the historical context was, was extremely valuable. I was impressed at how you managed to compress so much of that information into one book without spoiling the narrative as, as it went along. And at the same time, uh, what, 
she's so relevant. When, when, when you read the book, you can say, you can, you can look at her life and say, this puts me to shame. I should be doing things more like this. What, mm-hmm. what, what, did, what do you hope that Christians get from her life, indeed anyone who reads this book? Well, even though the world that she was born into does seem so different from the one we live in now, there are some striking similarities. So we, as you said, are largely a post-Christian culture. The culture she was born into was Christian in name only. So she still had to, to, to find ways to bring authentic Christianity to bear on the lives of her contemporaries and to bring Christian principles to bear on her society, which was desperately in need of them. Um, it was a society in which um, th- there were great sins facing the country, like the sin of slavery, but it was a sin that most of her contemporaries could not imagine being without. Um, it, even those who conceded it was a necessary evil, so to speak, thought that abolishing slavery would mean the end of the country because the country was so economically and socially dependent upon it. And, you know, I think about abortion today, which is an issue that is very similar in the sense that we are so steeped in abortion in our culture uh, that it's hard for most people to imagine how we could function without it because so many pregnancies end in abortion. Mm -hmm. And we can draw uh, from more in her friends lessons in how they they were united in working with each other they didn't give up some of the the abolition of slavery took decades to accomplish and they also found common cause with other people people who had different political and religious beliefs so they worked together they worked with uh with what we might call co-belligerents people that, with whom they disagreed on many other things but had common cause in, in fighting slavery or advancing some of their other causes. So I think there are many parallels between Moore's world and the, and the changes she was seeking to make in the name of Christianity that we can apply today. Well, Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me.